July 18th, 1984. Police officers walk through a McDonald's in San Isidro, California. They pass by half-eaten Happy Meals, a 9mm Uzi carbine, and what appears to be a couple with an infant between them. There are 21 bodies strewn about the restaurant, all people trying to get something to eat, having no idea it would be their last meal. To police, the scene is unreal, almost apocalyptic. They are witnessing the aftermath of what at the time is the deadliest shooting in the history of the US. This is the McDonald's Massacre. Born in 1942 to an extremely religious couple, James Huberty has a particularly rough childhood growing up in Canton, Ohio. When he's just three years old, he contracts polio, requiring him to wear these really uncomfortable steel braces on his legs. And when the day comes when he finally gets these off, he's left with a permanent limp. If this isn't bad enough, a few years later, James's mother abandons him, leaving the eight-year-old emotionally devastated. Because of his shy, introverted nature and his funny walk, the kid gets bullied at school and basically has no friends. James then takes a particular interest in guns and spends the majority of his time alone in his backyard shooting at targets for fun. When he graduates high school in 1960, he goes to a local community college where he meets his future wife Etna before dropping out shortly after. He later goes on to get a license for embalming, which is basically when you help prepare a dead person's body for funerals. In 1965, James and Etna get married and shortly after have two daughters, Zelia and Cassandra. However, a few years later, their house burns down and the family is forced to relocate to Canton, Ohio, the same place where James grew up. There he finds work as a welder, and it's around this time where he seems to go off the deep end. He regularly mistreats his daughters, often berating them with threats and sometimes striking them unprovoked. His wife Etna is also a victim of her husband's violent, erratic nature until she learns that she can subdue him through the use of tarot cards. She claims that she's able to read his future and James actually believes her and takes the advice very seriously. Soon, the neighbors also start to notice his strange behavior, viewing him as paranoid and obsessed with guns. See, James is what we call a self-proclaimed survivalist, meaning he thinks the US government is actively conspiring against him, so he must stock up on food and multiple firearms to defend his home in the upcoming apocalypse. He even has a homemade shooting range in the basement, and a family friend later says that there are so many guns in the house that no matter where James is standing in the home, he could simply reach over and grab a gun at any time. In 1983, he suffers a motorcycle accident that leaves his right arm permanently twitching, forcing him to resign as a welder, and here's where his mental health truly starts to decline. July 17th, 1984 the day before the McDonald's massacre. James calls a mental health center in San Isidro, but never gets a call back because they accidentally misspell his last name. The following morning, he takes his family to the San Diego Zoo, and after they're done, they go and grab some McDonald's for lunch. After they're finished eating, they make their way home from the restaurant, and James immediately begins gathering several weapons from his apartment. He puts on a maroon shirt and camouflage pants and leans in to kiss his wife goodbye. She asks him, where are you going? Because she's about to start making dinner pretty soon. To which he replies, I'm going hunting. Hunting for humans. He then drives to the nearest McDonald's, not the same one the family ate at earlier, and it's only a few hundred feet away from their apartment. At approximately 3.56 p.m., James pulls into a space in the parking lot. In his possession are several military-style weapons and a box filled with hundreds of rounds of ammunition. And as he walks down San Isidro Boulevard, a witness actually spots him with all his guns and calls the police, but accidentally tells them the wrong address. Meanwhile, James walks into the restaurant and orders everyone to lie on the ground. He then callously and ritualistically opens fire injuring and killing the majority of his victims in the first few minutes. James then slows down and takes his time, executing each survivor one by one. 
He then pulls out a radio, to which people assume that he's trying to listen in for police radar, but he starts playing music. Then dancing about wildly, sipping a coke, even throwing fries at the victims. Ten entire minutes after the first 911 call had been made, police finally arrive at the correct McDonald's and begin surrounding the area. There are 175 officers deployed in strategic locations, ensuring the incident is contained just to the restaurant. However, none of them actually go inside to help because they don't know how many shooters there are or the caliber of the situation. And at 5.05 p.m., officers are finally authorized to kill the perpetrator should they have a clear shot. 12 minutes later, James walks toward the drive through window and a SWAT sniper named Charles Foster has him in his crosshairs. He waits a moment and then fires a single round, piercing the perpetrator in his heart, killing him on impact. The entire ordeal lasts for 77 minutes. During that time, James fires off 257 rounds of ammunition, killing 21 people and injuring 19 others. The majority of his victims are Hispanic, and their ages range from 74 years to just eight months old. A few of the victims are kids unaccompanied by their parents, so officers take Polaroid pictures of their bodies and are forced to hold them up in large crowds of people. If it happens to be your child, you'd learn on the spot, but if you knew the kid's parent, they'd receive the grim news with a call. At the time, this is ranked the deadliest mass shooting in the US, but unfortunately we've had several others that have bumped it down to number five. And while this story is already quite unusual, there are a few bizarre events that occur after that make it one to remember. Further, Ray Kroc, the CEO and founder of McDonald's, donates a million dollars to the survivors and families of the victims, but the first person to receive their check is Etna Huberty. This event alone causes mass protest and public outcry, but in 1986, she takes things one step further when she sues McDonald's for $7.88 million. She has the nerve to claim that it was the chemicals in the chicken nuggets that caused her husband to commit the massacre. Thankfully, she loses, cause duh, and the San Ysidro McDonald's is replaced with Southwestern Community College. And at the very front of the school sits a memorial commemorating each of the 21 victims. I would like to tell all the victims who were killed or wounded at this time. I would just give them the advice that give your troubles to God and he'll help you get through it. He'll never give you more than you can take. I know that. 